Welcome back to another episode of Nemesis, and today we're going to talk about an interview real quickly uh, that Tom Hopper had with uh, Collider, a Steve Weintraub over at Collider. So I'll put a link to the article down below. Uh, this popped up recently, and I, you know, I'm sorry it took me a couple days to get to it and to cover it for you guys, but it's it's just pretty neat. It's just you know, uh, Steve who was interviewing him was uh, talking to Tom about his new movie SAS, uh, which had just came out recently, I think, on Netflix, and uh, and so he was doing promotions for that. It's called SAS Red Notice. And, uh, and so Tom Hopper obviously plays Albert Wesker in the film. And a lot of us are kind of curious what kind of take he's going to have on the character because obviously he's a fan favorite. Like Wesker is definitely a fan favorite. Like me personally, I'm a Chris Redfield fan, but I also like Wesker and I kind of see them as major nemesis, you know, <laughs> in a way. And our nemesi, nemesis. Um, and, and I like Tom Hopper as an actor. So I'm very curious to see you know, his portrayal of Wesker. And he's tall. He's a tall guy. So him towering over the team is kind of neat because then automatically he'll be intimidating, uh, which will be nice. Uh, but Albert Wesker obviously is the captain of the STARS team, and that is the Special Tactics and Rescue so uh, Squad or Rescue Service, depending on which version, you know, you get. And, uh, and that is the team that's being sent in to investigate the murders that have been popping up which turn out to be zombies. Uh, but obviously that might change. It might be a little bit different with this portrayal of the universe because they're mixing events that take place three months apart in the video game universes with the Resident Evil 1 video game storyline with Wesker kind of at the helm with the stars team. And then you have the uh, Resident Evil 2 characters with like Leon, Claire, and Ada and everything and, uh, and Birkin, you know. And so you have all of these now happening seemingly, I think, in the same uh, a night uh, it looks like um so or over the course of the same period of time and not three months apart so i'm you know been waiting to see if anyone gets any questions in when these uh, actors are going out and doing interviews obviously there's not a, a lot of interviewing nowadays but tom hopper he's pretty active online and on podcasts and things like that so i'm i'm glad he did you know got an interview in and he talked a little bit about res evil so i'll just read some of his quotes here and i'll have them up on screen as i read them the first one here is, uh, you know, he talks about, I think fans are, of the game will be happy, but at the same time, I think they should recognize that we want to make these characters as real and as grounded as possible. I feel like Wesker in the game obviously has that Agent Smith from Matrix type of idea. I wanted him to be a bit more three-dimensional than that and have a moral high ground. It's not just as cut and dry as it is in the game. There's an origin element to Wesker in this, uh, referring to in this story and what he maybe was before he turned into the one that we see in a lot of the video games. But I think from an aesthetic point of view, I think the games really influence this well. It is an aesthetic that certainly when we were shooting it, that I was like, man, it feels like the game. I'm really hoping that the fans of the game take something nice away from it, and then that it's a game plus more, or that it feels like the game plus more, plus more of a, a little bit more depth to these characters. So, you know, I, I appreciate that he says that and that there's maybe something in this storyline that kind of ties Wesker into the origins of what's happening, but there kind of already is that in the video games too. So I'm hoping that maybe Tom just doesn't know that about the video games and that what they're doing in the film is also pulled from that because although Wesker does come across, at least in the Paul Anderson movies, kind of an Agent Smith kind of guy, and that's certainly uh, Sean, who, the actor who plays him in that universe. Uh, that's kind of his portrayal, I think, is like this, you know, no nonsense, you know, just do my uh, job kind of guy. Um, so I think that's his take on Wesker. But the Wesker in the video games isn't really like that. He's a little bit like that in Resident Evil 1, only because he doesn't have a lot of lines. Like, he, you know, he's there, but he's like the leader of the team, but he kind of comes and goes throughout the storyline. Uh, whereas Chris and Jill are like the main focus, along with Rebecca, you know, and Barry and stuff. So, uh, so he's not a lot in the first game. So we don't actually get a ton of his backstory until future games, like Code Veronica, um, Resident Evil 5 especially, uh, and some of the, um, the you know, the railgun shooting games, like Umbrella Chronicles and things like that, and Darkseid Chronicles. You start to learn more about Wesker in that kind of stuff. Uh, so he's right. There's not a ton there in the first game, but in Resident Evil Zero and other games like that, they start peeling back the layers of Wesker. And what we know from Wesker in the games is that he is someone that was, you know, and this may be spoilers for the movie, so if you don't want any spoilers for Resident Evil, if you know nothing about Resident Evil or whatever and you don't want this spoiled, please walk away now because I'm going to reveal something pretty big. Um, so, yes, yeah, so walk away now. Thanks for watching the video. Hope you like it and come back for future videos. Um, but for those of you who are fans and, and who know, Wesker is kind of tied to the Umbrella Corporation, and uh, and he has 
origins with them. Like, you know, he was basically plucked from a young age and brought into this program called the, uh, you know, Project Wesker, which was, uh, you know, kind of head up by a scientist named Wesker. And he, along with Oswald E. Spencer, the person who kind of runs, uh, you know, Umbrella, uh, you know, the big guy that in charge, um, the two of them come up with this project called Project W or Project Wesker, and they pick 13 young, brilliant minds, and they bring them in and kind of start, uh, almost hypnotizing and brainwashing them in a lot of ways. Um, you know, they see that, all right, th these 13 candidates already have amazing potential. They have unique blood types. They have all these things that maybe, um, you know, we, we think are, are could benefit this company and our plans to look for immortality in some way, because ultimately that's what Oswald E. Spencer is looking for. He wants to perfect the progenitor virus, then into the T virus, because he wants to regenerate dying cells hoping that that could lead to a fountain of youth kind of thing where they could, you know, create immortality of some kind. Uh, so that's kind of their aspirations, or at least Oswald E. Spencer's aspirations. People who work under him just want to backstab each other and make a, month, a bunch of money, at, you know, and, and, uh, and, and unfortunately causes the, you know, the collapse of his company over time. Uh, but Wesker, he's one of these 13 that gets brought in. He's kind of groomed, uh, you know, because he's brought in at a young age. He's groomed by these people uh, that work for Oswald E. Spencer. And, He's, you know, shown, you know, they, they tap into his potential of like how smart he is. So they make him a scientist, but he also is capable of doing combat stuff. So eventually he works, you know, uh, you know, branches all away from science and into the field as far as, you know, being an agent of some kind and then leading, you know, eventually becoming the leader of stars for Raccoon City. So um, all and of all, of course, all that is because he works for Umbrella and he was a, a major scientist at Umbrella in his th early 30s, you know, working his way up. And then he was like, you know what, the next phase of my plans I'm going to need other experience. So he leaves, you know, the science route and goes into, uh, you know, uh, more military stuff, which he had kind of been training in on the side, but now he was making that his career. So, and he was able to transition from that career because Umbrella obviously owns the Raccoon City Police Department and has agents inside of it. And then also, um, you know, uh, he, you know, they created the stars group essentially. Uh, so I, I kind of like that. Like Umbrella has their hands in everything and it's very tinfoil hat conspiracy type thing of uh, guessing what else they might be involved in. So hearing all that, I was like, okay, maybe Tom just doesn't know the backstory of Wesker uh, from the first video game, uh, but that's okay. You know, maybe, maybe the movie will still play off of the things he's, you know, he doesn't know about because like I said, Wesker does have kind of an origin and a connection to you know the company of umbrella overall so um so then he said that but then also he goes on to say um you know for the aesthetic like they were talking about the aesthetic and so him uh tom hopper and uh, steve weintraub they were talking about director johannes robert or johannes roberts and his kind of vision for this and his attempt to produce a visually faithful experience uh to the games as possible and so uh so he says you know it's a bit like going into one of those VR things is what Tom said, uh, where you go into the VR world. He goes, that's what it was like. It was like playing the game, especially because we're all geared up. We have our guns and stuff, and it was pretty cool. We all looked at each other and went, oh, shit, this is so cool, <laughs> uh, because they were obviously walking around the Spencer Mansion, uh, which is which is really great, straight from the first video game. So, uh, so then Tom went on to say, there's been previous films, and I was thinking, how's this going to look different, and how's this going to be different? The one thing that I'd be uh, that I'd been told by my team and everything is like this is like going back. It's a whole new starter, and it's one that's going to try and hopefully please the fans of the game. When I started reading it, it really felt more like a script from a game, from one of the games. Uh, it felt immersive and it felt dirtier. It felt like Raccoon City was a grim place to be, and I immediately felt like it was a world that I related to more than anything. I've seen towns like this in America. That's what excited me about it that it felt relatable, I think. Even though you've got influence from the game, it felt like a relatable place to live. So we've heard Johannes Roberts say this in other interviews where he said he wants to make Raccoon City feel like a character, like it's an ensemble piece, but there's a reason it's this setting, kind of like how Assault on Precinct 13, it's, there's a reason it's that setting and it's kind of a part of the story that's being told. And that's how Raccoon City is meant to feel. So when you know Tom is saying this, he's like, you know, this place felt gritty and real and I've seen towns like this in America from what I understand of the story it seems like 
uh, that there's going to be uh, this, you know, kind of like how I talked about uh, Wooten, West Virginia before. Uh, that's where my grandfather, you know, that's where I grew up basically and, and spent my summers. Um, but my grandfather worked there at a steel mill, um, you know, through, I guess, the 70s and stuff and going in the 80s. And then the steel mill started to shut down. So a bunch of the people that worked there unionized and tried to keep the place open and started, you know, try to become their, the owners of the place. You know, they, they wanted to take over the steel mill because that, you know, basically uh, employed most of this town. And they knew if it went away, it would kind of crush the economy of this town. And in a lot of ways, it did when it finally did go under. Um, and so I was thinking about that while they were explaining this. And they were saying, yeah, there's parts you know, of Umbrella, how they kind of came into this town, built it up in a way. And now they're seemingly starting to abandon it. And I kind of like that. I, I kind of think about that sometimes when I was thinking of the Resident Evil 1 and 2 video games, how... There's, they take place in the late 90s, obviously, so, uh, you know, obviously the technology only goes up till then, but at the same time, like, I was thinking how Umbrella built this underground facility, and then they had this mansion um, out in the, you know, the Spencer Mansion with a small lab under it. They weren't, they had still experiments there, but they weren't really running anything. They were mainly just monitoring the, the experiments they already had done, like the Tyrant and the, you know, and, and Lisa Trevor and all that stuff, um, who eventually got loose on the grounds anyway. Um, and then you have like the training facility where Dr. Marcus was, which was also in the Arclay Mountains. And that place was completely abandoned. Like they just kind of shut that place down. And even though in Resident Evil Zero, they're on their way to reopen it, um, you could see it was very dilapidated and hadn't been used in like 10 or 15 years. So, um, you know, and then same with in the original Resident Evil 2, even though Resident Evil 2 remake is kind of what they're basing the aesthetic and look from this movie off of um with the rain and, and kind of like that that kind of um you know almost dream nightmare like uh, scenario kind of visual uh he did say that but in the original Resident Evil 2 those labs underneath Raccoon City were starting to fall apart too like they there was not a lot of upkeep there and that wasn't just because a virus outbreak you know outbreak happened it was because it was just not a lot of maintenance so it it felt like that and I was like you know that's pretty neat if Umbrella started their plans in this city and then they got what they wanted from the t virus and maybe the new g virus or whatever and they were like okay we can now leave and go to umbrella europe you know where we're developing the nemesis or we can go somewhere else uh, of course now nemesis apparently is also from raccoon city which that wasn't the case before but in the remakes they, they changed that I, I don't like that too much but uh, but there were other labs of of uh, you know the umbrella had around the world and so that would be kind of neat if they were just like all right we got what we wanted from the city and now we're just kind of slowly move our stuff out and in that process is how the outbreak happens that could be pretty neat too and then of course that would be a little bit like um you know a small town america where a company comes in tries to build it up and then t makes their money in bales and then the town is left struggling that could be interesting and that does feel relatable so I'm curious to see all that. I mean, of course, I went on like a, a, a possibility rant there of what could happen. Um, but I'm just, what he was saying here kind of got my wheels turning. And he says a little bit more, but I won't read everything. I'd rather direct you guys to the Collider article so you can read it for yourself. But I just wanted to cover some of those major quotes there because I thought it was interesting. And I'm, it does pump me up. It gets me uh, excited, especially when he talks a little bit about behind the scenes stuff. Like, oh, you know, my people, which he's talking about, you know, his uh, his probably his PR people and his manager and all that and his, and his agent they're probably the way they express uh, you know explain this to them they were probably like no this is a new thing like this is all new and it's going to be uh inspired more by the games visually than the other ones were and character wise than the other ones were um because eventually the other movies added wesker and chris redfield and and stuff like that but they didn't start there so it'll be nice to see them start here and and build a new uh, foundation going forward but also it feels kind of funny to me that they're calling this movie welcome to raccoon city and they might destroy this movie <laughs> or destroy the city in this movie because uh, raccoon city does get blown up <laughs> uh, you know obviously blown up obviously i'm doing a red letter media uh reference there but um it does get blown up at the end of resident evil 3 so who knows who knows if it'll get blown up in this movie um or if it'll just be the mansion and we'll stay around in raccoon city for another movie that would be really cool i'd love that um but uh, we'll see we'll see what, what happens here but uh i wanted to read this to you guys and share this information because we have one more bit of news uh, that came out about this movie and it's about a delay of its release so we'll get into that in the next episode because this episode's ran long enough so let me know what you think down below of all these comments and everything that tom said here and also check out the link down below if you want to read the rest of the article yourself and i'd love to hear your thoughts we'll continue our conversation as always in the com uh, comments down below so thank you so much i'll see you all in the future peace